special visitor that's here with us today <coughs> is Congressman Brett Guthrie, who represents our U.S. Congressional District. And so I know um, he's got some wonderful things to share with us today. So without further ado. Okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll give a little talk and then ask, answer some questions whenever it's time for y'all to do something different, let me know, and I'll, I'll sum, sum up. Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. Well, good. Y'all are w awake for sure, aren't you? This is fast time. I'm in Bowling Green, so I'm a little slow. We have slow time. So uh, it's about an hour earlier for me. But good. I live in Bowling Green, but I work in Washington, D.C. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But I know y'all have been studying the Revolutionary War, the Constitutional Convention, Congress, and how, how it works. So I want to kind of give some examples of that, if anybody... Does it mind? I'll do that. So uh, I'll start with why do we have the government that we have? I don't know if any of you guys watch a lot of television or news. So I want to talk about why we have the government we have. Because if you watch the news and your parents may talk about it, your grandparents, how frustrating sometimes it can be to get stuff done in Washington, to be done in, in our country. But there's a very good reason why we have separation of powers, checks and balances. I think Washington, D.C. is full of people to say that if I could just be king for a day, I could solve all these problems. But I'm going to talk about why we don't want anybody to be king for a day, even if they could solve all the problems in a good way. So let's kind of start with that. So if you lived in the United States, or well, in the United States, if you lived in America prior to July 4th, 1776, you were a citizen of what country? Oh, you're raising your hand? You're a citizen of what country? I got it here first. Great Britain. Great Britain. That's kind of a trick question because you really weren't a citizen of Great Britain. You were a subject. Not a subject of Great Britain, but a subject of someone in Great Britain. Who were you a subject of? The king. King George III. If you read the Declaration of Independence, that's most of our grievances are at the king, right? King George III. Now, when I talk about King George III, he did have a parliament. So there were people sort of elected at that time to help the king, but they were all the king's friends. They were all noble families. You didn't have regular people get elected back then. You do now. England's got it right. They have a, a democracy and voting. If They still have a queen, but they got it right, I think. And uh, the, the fact that the elected representatives govern. But back in the day, the king did everything. They were all subject to the king. So we were subject to the king. So the king made the law. The king was the, y'all studied about the legislative branch of government? That's what I'm a part of. In England, it was a king. And I know for history, there was a parliament, but it was, for all practical purposes, it was the king. Well, who enforced the law? Who was, this, who was the executive branch? Who do you think enforced the law in England? If the king decreed it, who enforced it? Who's that? You say something? Parliament? Par not parliament, not then. They do now. They do now. Who do you think... Who did the soldiers work for? Who do they march in the name of? Um, king George. King George III. So the soldiers did, but through the king. So the king was the legislative branch. The king was the executive branch. Well, who do you think you would appeal to if you had a judge? Who was the judge? Kind of a consistent theme. The king George III. Now, if you lived in America, you would go to a local governor. But the governor who you got judged by was appointed by, they served at the pleasure of the king. So even though there was elected parliament, who said parliament just a minute ago? We're going to get there in a second. They, they all worked for and was governed by the king. The king had almost absolute power. In England, it was a little different than other places, but that's mostly throughout history. If you read the Old Testament, the New Testament, King David, King Saul, King Herod, King... That's what most of history is. That's why it's important. That's why we're different. So the king made the laws, the king enforced the laws, the king judged the laws. Do you think if he made them, enforced them, and judged them, you would get a fair hearing if you ever had to challenge him? Nobody could challenge the king. Could the king do anything in England back in, the, back in the day? The king, could they tell you where to go to church? The most personal thing in your life is probably how you worship God. Could the king tell you where to go to church? Yes. King Henry VIII, who would probably be the great, 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 some seven or great uncle to the current queen, created his own church. And guess who was head of the church? Hello. The king. King Henry VIII was his name. So that was before George, his nephew some, down George III became king. So think about that. The king had all the power and can tell you where to go to church. If you didn't want to do what the king said, what would you do? You could hide. A lot of people hid and worshipped. 
or you can leave England. And so what is a pilgrim? Anybody know what the true definition? I, I know buckled shoes, funny hats, and muskets with round ends on the end, right? Is that what you're going to say? So what is the definition of what's a true pilgrim? Somebody that travels? To be free to free to worship, but to be free, freedom of freedom from religion. Um, freedom, like freedom of the religion, somebody who travels from place to place. Travels for faith. They left. That's what our pilgrims were. They were Puritans. They didn't want to be part of the Church of England. And the church, the king could either, and that happened in England, cut your head off and say you're going to worship though I am. If you're going to do your own thing, I'm going to, or let them leave. As a matter of fact, the kings really weren't all the times that bad. And there was a set of kings and queens that said, just leave. If you want to leave, go. Matter of fact, they gave them land to go. So most of our early, this is what's important now, most of our early colonies and states, particularly New England, not necessarily the South, the South developed different, but in New England and in the Mid-Atlantic states were developed by religious groups. That's the reason they were colonies. The Puritans, which were the pilgrims that we celebrate every Thanksgiving, went to Massachusetts. The Congregationalists, that's a group, a lot of these groups don't really exist like this anymore, went to Connecticut. The Quakers, anybody know who the Quaker state is? What's the Quaker state? Uh, William Penn was the leader of the Quakers. The guy on the oatmeal, but what state was that? He is the guy on the oatmeal. Quaker Oats, right? William Penn, that's a hint. Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania, so Catholics, and by amount you have to raise your hand, but there might be some Catholics. You had your own colony. The last Catholic Queen of England was Mary. So what do you think was the... Maryland. Maryland, yep, Maryland. And then the Baptists went to Rhode Island. Providence of God. They got there by providence of God. That's what they said. So if you're a Baptist, you had your own colony. It was Rhode Island. And the capital city today, if you go there, it's called Providence. That's what providence of God. So that the point is that I'm trying to make is the grandparents and great-grandparents of our founding fathers. Today they would be founding mothers. But back in those days, they only let the men go to the meetings. So I know there are a lot of strong women. Abigail Adams, that is just as much a founding father as a founding mother as a founding father. Martha Washington, but that, we're going to talk about founding fathers. That's just how they did it back then. Um, but the grandparents and the great-grandparents of our founding fathers left England because they wanted to worship. They wanted to worship in freedom and opportunities. But they came over and the king let them go. The king said, just go, and gave them land to go. We got over here, we started farming, we started raising crops, we started forming cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Richmond. We started making money. money. All of a sudden, the king got more interested in us because he wanted some of our money. And how does the government take money from you? Taxes. Taxes. So the king says, we're going to tax Americans. And we weren't really getting a lot of from He said, or his argument was, I got the Redcoats over there. They're keeping you safe from the French and the Indians, so you need to pay some money. But we said it's unfair because we, aren't, we don't have any say in how much you're charging us for this. You charge us on stamps, you charge our tea. We don't have any say in it. We said we don't believe in taxation without representation. representation. That's key to the one well, we have, the government we have. So it got to the point where we declared independence. We had to fight for independence. We won the Revolutionary War, now we're our own country. And the whole world recognizes we're now the United States of America. So we had to form a government. And remember, in everybody's back of their mind, if you read the Declaration of Independence, it was how dealing with one person who nobody chose. How do you get to be King of England? You might know how you get to be King of England? Family. You're born into it. Remember the current Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, is his fourth great granddaughter. George III is her fourth great grandparent. You ever seen pictures of Prince Charles or Prince William and Duchess Kate? Why are they important? Because their kid is going to, no other kid in England will be king of England except for Prince George, the little kid you see on television. As long as he survives his father, he'll be king. Nobody else will be. Nobody chose him. He was just born into it. Kind of weird way to run a government, isn't it? Now, England is mostly run by elected leaders now. But, so we had to form our own government. There was a group that said, let's get a king. We have our own George. It makes it easy. We already have King George signs everywhere. So we just have to erase the three and have our own George. 
what would be wrong with having King George the first of America? What do you think that was a bad idea? He was a good man, probably the greatest American to live so far, I would argue that. Well, this is back when he was alive. Oh. <laughs> yeah, back when he was alive. Because some of his decisions were not correct. Well, he could make incorrect decisions and nobody have any say about it, wouldn't it? We just got we just had a war for that, didn't we? So we said we got a former Because they already break free from a king. Yeah, we'll have another one, right? To create the same problem again. But every country in the world back then almost had a king. So we're we're gonna be if we want to be a country we want people to recognize us. We need our own king. And that, that's why this is such a great founding fathers and their wives who are founding mothers that came up with this idea because they said, we want to be different. We want to be unique. We're going to create something that's never been created. And, so the, and we're going to let people govern themselves. And the first thing they did, they were so scared of a king, so scared of one person becoming too important, they created a government that had no executive branch. So they called it the Articles of Confederation. They created a Congress. They had representatives who could lay taxes but couldn't collect them. They could like make laws but couldn't enforce them. Do you think it's very effective if you can raise a tax but you can't collect it? Do you think it's, no, no money comes in, does it? Does it make it effective if you make laws but you can't enforce them? People just ignore them, don't they? So they got back together in Philadelphia. This is the meat of our story then. Remember how bad the king was, how bad that government was. It doesn't work not to have some kind of government. That just really doesn't work. We have to govern ourselves. And so let's come up with a way to do it. So the first thing they said, well, let's take the three major parts of government. Make the laws, enforce the laws, and judge the law. And let's divide that out. So it's okay, let's create people that make the laws. So that's what I do. So I'm a legislator. I'm in the Congress. I'm in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, there's another house called the Senate, and we make the laws. So I'm called a representative. Remember, we, so we make the laws. Taxes are a law. The, the amount of tax you pay is in according to law. So we said no taxation without? Representation. So we're going to have taxation. We better have? Representation. So we created a government like that. Of the people, I live in this part of Kentucky by the people. I'm chosen by people 18 and older for the people, right? So I'm there to represent your, you. You're part of my boss. Even though you don't I love to vote, you're still my boss. I represent 750,000 people, some number of like that close to that. Changes a little bit every year. And so I'm your representative. So I'm the one who can raise your taxes or lower your taxes. But I can't do it by myself. I can't do it, but I got to have the whole house, a majority of the House of Representatives pass it, and a majority of senators pass it. Now, there's 435 House members. So, for me to get something put into law, I've got to get 218 to agree with me. Do you think that's difficult to do? Get 218 people, some from New York, some from Philadelphia, some from North Dakota, some from Kentucky to agree? Absolutely. But then I got to get a Senate to agree. Why do we have two? Not only do we make it difficult, we made it extremely difficult by having two. Right, you have different representation, right. So for something to become law, currently there are bills passing the House that are probably not going to pass the Senate. So you got to get both to do it. So why do we think we have, what's the major difference in the House and the Senate? Anybody know what the major difference is? There's some subtle differences. Members of the House are better looking. I'm kidding. I'm joking with that. What do you think is the major difference in the House and the Senate? Um, the Senate is, uh, is based on like equal, like it has equal members in the, uh, the House of Representatives. It's based on population. Say that really loud because you're absolutely correct. Uh, the House of Representatives <laughs> is based on population. Oh, based on population? So that, he's like, all right, so I'm going to summarize that. You're perfect. Absolutely perfect. So when they were meeting about, we're going to come together. We're going to be 13 states instead of 13 countries. We're going to have a government of representatives. So I'm going to make the, so if you go back and check me on the, in Wikipedia, the numbers aren't right, but it makes the math work for me because I'm simple. So let's say Rhode Island had 100,000 people. And New York had a million people. Big state, small state, right? So Rhode Island would say, well, let's have a representatives that meet in a capital to make our laws. And every state should be equal. Because every state's equal, so every state should be equal, so everybody gets one. 
So if that happened, one person from Rhode Island would show up who represented 100,000 people, and one person from New York would show up who represents a million people. Is that fair to New York? Mm -hmm. So New York would say, oh, I'll tell you what we should do. Let's base it on population. So let's say every 100,000 people gets one representative. So Rhode Island would get one, and New York would get 10. Now, if you're from Rhode Island, would you say, wait a minute, this is just going to be a country of big states. Because 10 always beats one, right? Yeah. If they stick together, 10 always beats one. So they said, so the small state says, we're not going to agree to that. When the big states say, well, this is where all the money is, it's in New York, it's in Boston, it's in Philadelphia, in Richmond. And we're afraid the small states will just team up and raise taxes and all the, take all the money from us. So they compromised. They said, let's create a House of Representatives based on population. Ex what's your first name? Jaden. Jaden, can I pick on you in a few minutes? Okay, because you had the absolute correct answer. House of Representatives based on population. There's 435 of us. They count everybody. Next year, they're going to count everybody in the country. See how many each state has. Kentucky has 4.5 million. California has 34.5 million. So there's 30 million more people in California than Kentucky. And so they divide it up. So to, when I get back the week after Easter, when I show up to vote on the first night, there are going to be six people from Kentucky. There are about seven hundred and some thousand. We have four and a half million. There will be six Kentuckians. There will be 53 from California. 53. So to this day, our, what our founding fathers agreed to, there's 53 Californians to six Kentuckians. I know they won't beat us in basketball, but 53 always beat six in voting, if they stick together. That's a different story. We'll get into that. That'll be an all, that's a whole semester course. But 53 always beat six. So is it fair that there's 53 Californians and only six Kentuckians? Yes. So what was the other body, not the House, but the Senate. Senate. So the Senate has 30, remember California has 34 and a half million people. They have two senators. Kamala Harris and Diane Feinstein. Two senator, lady senators from California. Kentucky has four and a half million people. So California has 30 million more people and we have two senators. So when Senator McConnell and Senator Paul, Rand Paul, when they go to the Senate next week, there'll be two from California and two from Kentucky. There'll be two from New York and two from North Dakota. Two from South Dakota. When I go back, there'll be one from North Dakota, one from South Dakota, one from Wyoming, 53 from California, 34 from Florida, 36 from Texas, six from seven from Tennessee. So it's all divided up. But for a bill to become law, so this is what checks and balances, for a bill to become law, it's got to pass the House, where Cal the Californians have a bigger say, and it's got to pass the Senate, where all states are equal. So that's a pretty good device there, because it means big states just can't dominate, and it also means small states can't dominate. It's got to go through the House, too. And that's a balance that our founding father said. But that's not all that happens to become law. So we have the legislative branch, but we have checks and balances. So the balance is between the House and the Senate, big states, small states. But the check is the president has to sign a bill before it becomes law. And the argument is, I represent central Kentucky, so I represent Fort Knox. Do you think I'm very interested in what happens at Fort Knox? Do you think I'm very interested in the... I'm, 100% foremost total, what is the military mission to save our, keep our country safe? But I'm also very focused on how Fort Knox fits into that and promotes that. Senator McConnell and Senator Paul are the same, except they're also focused on Fort Knox and Fort Campbell. I don't represent Fort Campbell. The president is responsible for everything. So the idea is we're going to vote kind of local, how we think locally. I'll get, I, he can do the question, I'll get to him. To locally, the senators are state, how, the, how our local districts fit in the national defense, how the state fits in national defense, but the president has everything fits. Now, if the president says no to a law, it comes back to the House and Senate, and we can pass it, but it takes two-thirds. So right now, it takes 218 votes. If the president said, no, I'm not going to sign, it would take 290 votes. That's a lot of votes. I know that doesn't say a lot, but that's a big difference in the House. In the Senate, it takes 51 votes. There's 100 senators, 50 states times two. It takes 67 if the president won't sign a law, bill to become law. 
That's nearly impossible to do in the current environment. So the president has a lot of power, has a lot of checks on the legislature. So we pass a law. One of the laws is the budget, taxes and spending. So we pass a law to say we're going to widen I-65 to six lanes. That's part of the law that I was part of. So we pass a law to say, anybody been out on I- Matter of fact, y'all, don't y'all miss the goat? Yeah. Yeah. I loved Houdini, didn't you? But Houdini was out there hanging out with construction workers, weren't they? Yeah. So he was out there building that. So that's a federal highway, federal money. And so the president's responsible for building the highways. Has anybody seen President Trump out there feeding the goat? No. Anybody seen him out there on a dump truck? No. Before President Trump, anybody see President Obama out there in a dump truck? No. Laying asphalt? No. But the president does it. How's the president operate? You know how there's a small group of people that he manages that manage the government. Anybody have y'all studied what that is? The cabinet. Who said cabinet? You said cabinet? You're absolutely correct. The cabinet. So President Trump appoints a secretary of transportation. Her name is Elaine Childs from Louisville, actually, a Kentuckian, who hires the people who hires the people who are out there working today. And uh, so if so there so the legislative branch passes a law to say if you put your money in a bank, somebody can't take it out without your permission. It's your money. Nobody can rob a bank and take your money. Is that a fair law, we think? So the president enforces the law. So if somebody robs a bank, of course the local police would react. But then the federal police, you know who the federal police is? FBI. So the FBI would show up and start investigating. If somebody robs a bank, would President Trump fly down here on Air Force One, run to the bank and start interviewing? No. No, he does it through his cabinet. President Trump appoints an attorney general who hires the FBI director, who hires the FBI. But President Trump's responsible for it, and that's important to know. Does he get to hire anybody that he wants to? So what happened? How do you get to be in the cabinet? He doesn't get to hire anybody he wants to. You get voted in by who? Well, not the people. A select group of people. The president picks them, and the Senate votes them in. The Senate votes them in. So you got the legislative branch. The executive branch picks who works in the executive branch, but is voted on by the Senate, which is the legislative branch. Not the House. That'd be too big of a process. But the Senate, which every state's equal. So every state has an equal say in who works in the cabinet. So let's say Jaden, right? Let's say right now in Elizabethtown, somebody's in there robbing a bank. They go into the bank and they rob the bank. And they're wearing the Under Armour, black Under Armour shirt. They got nice short, nice haircut. Uh, Under Armour, black Under Armour shirt with gray slacks and gray, gray shorts and gray shoes with black socks. They look just like Jaden. Well, it couldn't be Jaden because Jaden's sitting right here, right? We know it couldn't be Jaden. Either they're setting you up or there's somebody else that looks just like you. But somebody that looks just like Jaden robbed a bank right now at 1032. So the police, the FBI comes in, they take the pictures and they look at it. Oh, we know who that is. He's a young 10 or 11 year old. 10 or 11? About, 11, about to be 11 year old at Creekside Elementary and they swing in here and you go, wow, what are all the cop car policemen doing here? And they take Jaden off and they take him to, to jail. Now who does the FBI work for? They work for the president. Let's say in the old system of the king system, right? You go to somebody that works for the king or somebody that, or you go to the king. Even in the, like the old New Testament, Paul was going to see Caesar to appeal to him as a judge. And Caesar's the Italian word for king, or Roman word for king. So that's how most, century, that's how most people have done it. So Jaden, let's say Jaden had to go to Washington, D.C., had to go to the White House, had to go into the Oval Office and say, Mr. President, the people you hired, the people you chose, the people that work for you, who you know, who they may, do you know President Trump personally? You know him personally? Okay. But people he knows, so most of them he knows personally, arrested me, and they're wrong. Now, who do you think is going to get the benefit of the doubt? Trump. You're probably not going to, they're probably going to believe, well, I hired the best attorney general who hired the best FBI director who hires the FBI. It looks like you in the picture. I'm going to go with my guys, right? That's not how our, our system doesn't work that way. Our founding fathers decided how to... So who would you go see? A judge. Who said judge? You're right. 
the just ju judicial branch. Go see a judge. Now you wouldn't see the Supreme Court at your level, but also you're guaranteed a right by the judge jury by with well, trial by jury. So if they took him all the way to trial, he could show up, he could call witnesses before an impartial judge, and he would call everybody in this room right now and we'd all sit there going, I know that was a handsome young 11 year old that robbed that bank and he's wearing the same clothes, but it wasn't Jaden because Jaden was sitting with us and you would get dismissed. And now think about it, if you went to the president or anybody that the people that worked for him got the wrong person, they're probably going to be biased. Not just President Trump, any president. I used President Obama in the same examples a couple of years ago. But you go to a judge that doesn't work for the president and doesn't work for the legislature. Works for themselves. Now how do you get to be a judge? Checks and balances again. You're right. That's for county judges. How do you get to be a federal judge? You're right. This gets confusing because you've probably seen people get elected. There's a judge that represents the county. Well, there's a state judges too. But at the federal Supreme Court, how do you get in the Supreme Court? The president picks you. It just happened just last fall. The president picks you, but you've got to be confirmed by the... So the executive branch picks the judicial branch, but it's got to be confirmed by the Senate, the legislative branch. See the checks and balances? So the president, well, wait a minute. So wait a minute. So Jaden goes to see the judge. Let's say it gets to the Supreme Court, and you go to the judges, and the judges sitting there had been appointed by President Trump. Why aren't they biased to President Trump? Why don't they have the same problem? What did our, our founding fathers thought of that and fixed it? Why do they? How long do you get to be a judge? Well, there's different levels of judges, so you're right about district judges in Kentucky. How, do you get to, how long do you get to be a Supreme Court judge? I'll say that. For life. So President Trump can't say, hey, I got this Jaden kid over there. I want you to put him in jail. If you don't, I'm going to take you off the bench. He can't do that. Judges are there for life. They have to retire or die. That's the only way you leave the Supreme Court. Unless you rob a bank, there's a provision if a judge commits a crime... But not because they make a bad decision, because they commit a crime. They have to do a crime. Treason or a crime. And then the president can't even do it. It's the legislative branch that does it. So I'm going to finish with one example. Can I make any law that I want to make? No. No? I can't make any law. What, what limits me by the laws I make? The laws I can make. The Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights. You got the answer. You just stole my answer. I was going to give you an example. I'll give you one. Let's say... Um, I would never do this, but it makes the example work. Let's say, and I do believe this, I think our country's divided and we should be more united and we should work together. So let's say I'm at home before I go back to Washington next week and I go, you know what, I think it's Easter. I'm using this for example. You know, we should all, if we all went to the same church and we all worshiped together and we all read the same, said the same prayer, at the same, it would probably unite us as a country. And so what, we just get rid of all the churches and create church for America. So I go and I, I would never do this. I know I'm on TV, so I gotta make sure I clarify and somebody comes in the middle of a, watching this, then they know I'm not advocating it. But it's for argument. So I go and I get 218 members of the House to vote for that. I go to the Senate. I go to the Senate leader who's from Kentucky, Senator McConnell. He would never do this, but let's say I convince him to pass it through the Senate. So the bill says there's only one church, it's Church for America, everybody has to go there. Goes to the president, I go to the White House, President Trump, I think this would just bring us all together. He signs it. And our soldiers were there. We are, some of you may have family members that are great hero, heroes. Moms or dads may be great heroes. But, so they would never do this either. But let's say you show up to your church on Sunday, and a soldier standing there going, nope, this church is shut down. You have to go to the Church for America, the one that's created. And everybody has to go there. That happened in England in the 1500s. But it happened. What? And our founding fathers, remember? Their grandparents and great-grandparents came over here because they were pilgrims. So you said people who travel for faith. So you said, what's the Bill of Rights? What keeps me from, how would you keep from, so you said Bill of Rights. So which amendment, do you know? The first one. So you would go to court. You would go see a judge. And you would say, judge, the First Amendment of the Constitu Constitution is supreme, then the laws are under the Constitution. The First Amendment doesn't say Congress can make a church for America, does it? It says Congress shall make no law 
establishing a religion. And so I just said I made that law, right? So you would go to a judge, and the judge would say, this is, violates the Constitution. The second part of that clause, nobody, people don't talk about it as much, but it says, just as important. It says, Congress shall make no law establishing a religion, so I can't create the church for America. And it says, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So I can't say, well, I can't create a church for America, but you can't go to that church. You can go to any church that you want to, and the Constitution guarantees that. And so you would go, remember you got the legislative branch. Bills have to be signed by the executive unless we get two-thirds. The executive works through a cabinet approved by the legislative branch. The judicial branch is picked by the executive branch, president, but confirmed by the Senate legislative branch. Now the judicial branch gets to review our laws and say, do they meet the, do they meet the Bill of Rights? And they would obviously say no, and that law would go away. We don't pass laws like that that are clearly, clearly unconstitutional. Sometimes there's some that are, well, the interpretation of the Constitution. We, we go to court all the time to try to decide, does the law match the Constitution? It's never that clear. Nobody tries to do that. That would be clearly unconstitutional. But it's a good example to use. So we have checks and balances. We have representatives. I get to do that for you. I'd like to answer questions for you about Washington before I want one thing, but that remember Washington's not the only government and capital we have. Who's the best math person here? You're the best math. All right, keep up with this. This is how many people govern you. And I'm only going to talk the big ones, right? So we have 435 House members, 100 senators, president, vice president, and nine Supreme Court justices. So you got that? So is that all the government we have? Is there another capital city somewhere in Kentucky? Frankfurt, right? Frankfurt. So now you have, you, have a, you have a state congress. It's called the General Assembly. So I add this. So in the General Assembly, you have 100 House members and 38 senators. So there's state senators too. Governor, lieutenant governor, and at the state level, seven Supreme Court justices. Is that all the government you have? You live in the county of? Hardin. 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 So now you have a county judge, Harry Berry. He's the president of the county. He's the executive branch of the county, but he's also fiscal court. I guess you have six, so you have a Judge Barry, add another six. I think you have six magistrates. Do you know the number? Probably six. Some of you may live in Upton, Sonora, uh, Lisbethtown. Some of you might. I don't know if Cecilia's incorporated. If that, you live in a city. So now all of a sudden, if you live in Upton, you got a mayor. That's the so add the mayor, and you probably have four council members or six. So how many is that? Well over 800, isn't it? It's well over 800. England, they had one that had all the power. We have 800 that's divided, check on each other, and some things are done in Washington, some things are done in Frankfurt, some things are done in the county, Hardin County, and some things are done in your city. Does it take all, is it easier to get things done if one person makes the decision? No. It is easier. Is it more efficient? It's more efficient. Is it hard to get things done when you got to get 800 people sometimes working together? Yes. Absolutely. Like I said, D.C. is full of people saying, if I could just be king for a day, I could solve all these problems. But remember, if you could be king for a day, you become king for life, and you could tell people where to go to church. What are your questions? Anything about Washington, knowing Washington, working in Washington, living in Washington, traveling to Washington? What? Why do you like so why do I live in Kentucky and travel to every state? Yeah. Uh, I think you were the one that said by population and Senate. Right? No, it was Jaden. Mm -hmm. Jaden did that. Well, because we all, every state has representatives. So we all go to, the, I fly um, Southwest Airlines or American Airlines. I usually fly to Nashville there. And uh, so we're out for two weeks because of Easter. We break the week before, week after Easter. So I had the week, the May the, after the weekend after Easter, I'll fly back and we meet. We have people that are flying from Alaska. That's why we have two week breaks at times because it's easy for me to get back. It's about an hour and a half flight from Nashville. But think about it, if you live in Hawaii, it's about a 14 hour flight. So it's hard to go back and forth all the time. And so that's what we're all from each. That's the beauty of where we're of the people. Remember when they chose Washington, it was the center of the country at the time. Uh, now, if you want to the center of the country, it'd be Kansas City. But that's, we're never going to change that.
that I could foresee. Yes? Have you ever got to talk to Trump, uh, President Trump? I do. I saw him last week. He was in a meeting and he said he wanted to decide, is he going to, this is political so I won't get into it, but he was trying to figure out, should we keep his motto as Make America Great Again? Or should his new re-election motto be Keep America Great? Because he's already made it great again. So, that, that was the question. How many states have you been to? I think the other day I counted, I've been to 43 states. But all of that was as a kid. I had cousins that lived in New Mexico, so I would drive out that way. So just in the course of my life, I, I have not been to like Montana, South Dakota, Idaho, those up in the Northwest. I need to do the Northwest. How did you decide that you wanted to run for, for Congress? Well, for Congress, so it goes back a little further. So when I was in high school, I know my people have heard this before, are tired of me hearing that, but I really want to be a football player. But if God, but you got to think about it. Football means God's got to make you big and fast. Slow and small doesn't work. You can't make any money playing football slow and small. So you got to have options, right? No, I actually was a high school football, broke my shoulder. I was laid up and I'm collarbone and laid up in bed for a few weeks. It was 1980, 7980 that era, and Ronald Reagan was running for president. And I've listened to him on TV and I became a fan of President Reagan. But I actually want to be a good, how many people... And I hate to ask questions because you don't want to put people on the spot, but anybody here have a mom or dad that's serving at Fort Knox right now? Good. Your mom and dad are heroes. And if you have ever served, they're heroes too. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be a career military person. So I went to West Point. Ronald Reagan talked about, back then, the Russians were called Soviets. So I wanted to be in Europe. I wanted to be there to be ready if the, we ever had World War III. That was kind of my interest in government service. Got out. The Soviets became Russians again, and they became our friends for a while. So the Army looked like it was going to be boring. If your mom and dad, if any of you had parents in the service the last 10, 15 years, it's not been boring. It's been anything but. It's been sacrificial to, probably the most sacrificial of any generation that served, other than all it. I know World War II was probably bigger, but it was all within four years. Some people have been doing this for 17 years, 18 years now. Um, but I got out. And I worked in manufacturing, and then an opportunity to run for the state senate came open, which says education. I was particularly interested in adult education. So I know there are people that just want to get into politics because they have all the time. People want to come to Washington. They're out of high school, out of college, and I just want to be in government or whatever. I always try to find a cause, and mine was really adult ed. And then my predecessor, who's from Cecilia, decided to retire and, you know, the Washington. Because remember, we have state government. As I was, that's where I was. But federal government, they do different things, and federal government does the Army. The military stuff is done at the Washington, D.C., foreign affairs, the budget, and stuff like that. That became my interest. How many schools have you been to? How many, to visit schools or go to, to like, graduate from? Visit. Boy, I've been doing this since the state senate. So it's been several, several schools. I wish I'd go to every one in the, tw in my, I have 21 counties. And there are a lot of schools in there, and some counties have a lot, like Hardin County has a lot of schools. So I wish I could do with them all. But I try to do as many as I can. I enjoy it. I enjoy talking with you. And I've learned, too, if, when you learn, if you get into politics and government, when you go to meetings, it's a lot of times you go to Chamber of Commerce. I get to meet your teachers, your guidance counselors today, people in the lunchroom. And a lot of times they don't get to go to Chamber of Commerce meetings and meet representatives. So, one, I get to talk to you all and hopefully try to inspire you all to like, understand government and, and vote when you get to be old enough. Hopefully some of you want to be in government service, but also get to meet your teachers and your principal and everybody, which I enjoy. Yes? Um, how much money do you make as a A member of Congress makes $174,000. Yeah. A year? A year. A year. But you got to live in two places. But it's, it's a comfortable living. I'm not complaining about it. But it's 174. That's the salary. It's been that since I got there 10 years ago. How many hours do I work a day? It depends on where I am. Like uh, yesterday, I had to get up at 4.15 because I had to speak at a Chamber of Commerce breakfast in um, Breckenridge County, which is a couple hour drive. So I had to leave my house about 5 to be there at 7. Uh, and I got home late afternoon and got some stuff done around the house. When I'm in D.C., I usually start uh, about 8 in the morning. and usually doing about 6 or 7 at night. So there's, it's just different um, each week. There's one thing, it's not an office job where you're 9 to 5. You're kind of, somebody asked the mayor of Irvington, I was there yesterday, how many hours she worked. She goes, quite honestly, I'm there 24-7 when the phone rings. So you're always kind of on call, but you do take some time to be with family. You have to, or else you'll never see them. Uh, but uh, like today, I left, we left at 7 this morning, so I've already made a stop here. I'm going to speak to a group in uh, LaRue County. 
and then a meeting with somebody this afternoon at Western about some uh, immigration stuff. So uh, pretty full day, but it's it's uh, people labor harder. I've, I, I used to work in a foundry, so people who work from seven to three thirty work less hours, but work, work harder. So I'm not complaining about it, but it's busy. But I enjoy doing it. Have you ever had second thoughts about, oh, we have some tough votes. Because, you know, I use the example of, um, I use the example of creating a church, which everybody in the room agrees it just doesn't comply with the First Amendment. We've had votes on 9-11 and terrorism and how do, you find, how do you catch terrorists. And there's another amendment, the Fourth Amendment says unreasonable search and seizures. That's what the Constitution says. It doesn't say no search and seizures. It says unreasonable search and seizures without a subpoena or warrant. So what's unreasonable? And you got to you got to get 218 people to agree on what that is, and then a judge is finally going to go before a judge and find figure out what that is. So when you're trying to spy on foreign terrorists, but you might have a American citizen talking to that foreign terrorist, where do you have to quit spying and go get in a warrant because there's an American citizen talking? Is it reasonable? I mean, what's reasonable? And, and so there's a vote. Basically, if a foreign terrorist was talking to an American, ter American citizen and you knew it was a foreign terrorist that you just had to stop and go to the judge and get a warrant, you had to quit listening. My argument, and I voted for it, and a lot of people disagreed with, and the majority did, is that if you're talking to a foreign terrorist on a, a, public, on a telephone, you, uh, you have the right to your conversation to be private, but the fact that you dial that number, which is in every phone record, isn't. And those are the kind of things that get the constitutional questions. What's unreasonable? I didn't think that was unreasonable. To say, this person's talking to that foreign terrorist, now let's go get a warrant and figure out if, let a judge say you can go investigate. But those are the kind of things you have second thoughts on. Or just on your job in general, you know, being away from home probably is second thoughts. My kids are now in college, my youngest one is, and she was in high school when I got, or junior high when I got elected and missed some of her high school stuff. That's second thoughts you have. Have you actually met Mitch McConnell in real life? Yeah, I've known him pretty well. Doing pretty well. I met President Obama a few times. I met President Trump quite a bit. Been around him quite a bit. Not really talked to him a few times, but around him quite a bit. Are you a fan of President Trump? I do support President Trump. Yeah. Do you ever get tired of traveling? Do I get tired of? Tra yeah. <laughs> you sitting on an airplane. I gotta fly in the morning. Like it's usually on a Sunday night when I know I gotta get up and drive to the airport. I don't ever get tired of traveling back to Kentucky. I get tired of traveling away sometimes, but you do. And but I, you think about it, a lot of your parents have hard jobs, hard work. So when I complain, when I get sad and tired of driving to the airport, sitting on an airplane, flying to Washington D.C., I tell myself, I'm going to the airport. I'm going to get something at Burger King. I'm going to get on an airplane. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to land on the other end. So uh, I shouldn't complain, right? Because a lot of people work a lot harder than that. Why well, they put stars on what? On the American flag. Each star represents the state. You know that's how Betsy Ross designed it. I don't know why she chose stars instead of when she had the 13 stars. You know, I had an uncle killed in the Korean War, and he was killed in 1952. And we found a flag at my, when my grandmother passed away that appeared to be the one that would have been on his coffin when he came back. This is you may remind me of the story, so I'll tell it. And so uh, it was folded up and have him in my office in Washington to honor him and his service. And so my, he was an Eagle Scout, and my brother's son became an Eagle Scout. So he says, bring, could you bring Uncle Bobby's flag so, flag so we'll use it for my, something for my nephew's Eagle Scout ceremony. So we unfurled the flag, and we, were, we thought the way my grandmother had stored it, it was the flag that would have accompanied him home from Korea. But we weren't 100% sure. So think about 1952. What weren't states in 1952? Hawaii and Alaska were states. So they unfurled the flag, and I just didn't want to, and I thought about that. I said, if that flag has 50 stars, it's not the right flag. But it was a 48 star flag. So we're convinced it was my uncle's flag. Yeah, it was a 48 star flag. Have you been in the Oval Office? You know, I, it's funny, I've been right next to the Oval Office. The President Trump will meet individually in the Oval Office. I was with a group of about 10 or 11, the smallest man I had with him. There's a room next to the Oval Office, a conference room called the Roosevelt Room. So I met with him there, and it's where they have the um, um, 
Teddy Roosevelt won the Medal of Honor at, at uh, San Juan Hill, the Rough Riders, right? And so his Medal of Honor's there. So I got to see that, that's pretty cool. But in the, I've been to the Oval Office, but I never met, had a personal meeting with President Trump there, or President Obama. And I actually served about two weeks with President Bush because I got elected in 08 and he was leaving and, and Obama, President Obama was coming in. We said, we hadn't asked the crowd. I know we're probably getting short on time. So you hadn't asked one yet? Yeah, we've been in the Pentagon. I have been in the Pentagon. That's where our, our, runs most of our armies out of the Pentagon. Been in the Pentagon a few times. Since, since I went to military school, I have a lot of friends who serve in the Pentagon. One of my good friends is a three-star general there. Oh, a few times. I don't know the number. You know what the coolest thing I ever did in the White House? So a friend of mine I went to college with is a three-star general. His name is H.R. McMaster. He was the President's National Security Advisor. And there were two American heroes on a train outside of Paris when a terrorist attack took place and they, they, they tackled and stopped the terrorist attack from taking place. So they made a movie about them called 915 to Paris or 9 something to Paris. I, I can't remember the actual, something to Paris, if you watched it. Well, they had the two heroes in a movie at the White House. They have a movie theater at the White House. And so my three-star general friend invited me. So I watched that movie with the two heroes, President Trump and a couple of, of several army people in the White House. It's pretty cool. Well, I, I know you are from an army town, so one of the reasons I love coming to Hardin County I know Army Town's Ratcliffe on the other way, but, but I know all of you are tied into it in this community. And so everybody that mentioned, or everybody that, didn't, that wanted to mention a parent or an uncle or a grandfather, tell them, if, you, if they're still alive, tell them thank you. We appreciate it very much. There you go. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it.